Guten Abend und herzlich Yes, good evening and welcome. I'm Ben Scheller. I'm uh, in charge of North Africa and Middle East at Heinrich Böll Stiftung, and I welcome you to the event Syria after the invasion of Turkey. How can Europe uh, support the civilians? Uh, we, uh, the operation of this invasion, it's called peace source. Of course, it's very misleading um, to name or to call an offensive an evasion uh, like that, uh, um, even though it has been broken by ceasefires, uh, you know, it's very cynical. And uh, of course, it was introduced by another change of mind uh, of the Americans, of Donald Trump, uh, who uh, stopped the support for the Syrian Democratic Forces uh, who were in control of uh, the eastern region of the Euphrates and also in the south near Raqqa. And um, so this um, intervention, this invasion, uh, of course, uh, was uh, uh, pretty much ignored by Europe because it was carried out by a NATO partner. And uh, of course, uh, the two NATO partners uh, did not want to stress uh, the defense uh, organization. And of course, we have now all the focus on Syria, rather for a um, out of a uh, sad event. And uh, but therefore, we have organized this very spontaneous um, event uh, on Syria. And I'm very happy to have uh, three experts on the panel. To my right is Farhad Ahma. He is the head of PEL, Civil Waves, a civil uh, organization uh, that's active in the Kurdish regions, uh, supporting youth work, and uh, also has a focus uh, on humanitarian support. Now, next to him is uh, Kirsten Hellberg. She's a political scientist, and uh, for seven years uh, she uh, reported from Damascus as a journalist and uh, so wrote three books on Syria, um, which deal with history and also how Syria got into the conflict and also explain very well what happened uh, in the last couple of years. And to my left, Inanna Oman. Um, she is doing a doctorate at uh, Humboldt University um, and has um, a place at the Leibniz uh, Center for Oriental Studies. And she is been she was born in the province of Hasake, uh, where the conflict is raging at the moment. And uh, she's organized here in the, a group uh, called Takeover. And uh, welcome to you. To the panel. And I would like to uh, point out one thing before the uh, event. We also have a partner called Adopt a Revolution, a civil society organization which in Germany is very much organized in supporting projects uh, for civilians in Syria, even though. Uh, Germany has not started deporting to Syria. The debate has started, uh, you know, when can you start deporting people? So the pressure is on from right-wing circles, also returning civilians, uh, etc. I'm sure that we will discuss how safe it is in Syria and where it is safe or can be safe. and. Uh, but I would like to also point out that the um, campaign of Adopt a Revolution is ongoing at the moment, so you can um, certainly support them by signing their list and uh, against the deportations to Syria. And first of all, via the panel, I would like to uh, discuss some questions that we had uh, received beforehand, but also uh, want to take your questions and your comments regarding the situation. And uh, I would like to also to be brief, uh, either on the panel or um, 
among um, the viewers. And uh, uh, I would like to also um, describe the situation um, focusing on the Kurdish regions. Maybe, Fahad, you could um, tell us a little bit about what is uh, in the, the information you get. What's the situation since the Turkish invasion? Well, many thanks for the invitation. Can you hear me? OK, so what does it look like in these regions? Um, it's terrible, uh, really, for uh, civilians, most of all. And we, as civil actors, um, as all other people and the entire world, uh, we were surprised by this attack. And we, we assumed that something could happen at some point, but the point in time that it would happen so fast and that the Americans uh, obviously gave a green light to Turkey uh, to invade with their military. Uh, that uh, for us as a civilian organization and for the people um, on site was a big surprise. And uh, the people we talked to, until the last moment, they were hoping that uh, these plans of Turkey could be stopped, but that wasn't the case. And therefore, the um, uh, people started fleeing. Uh, we uh, have five uh, refugee centers in the province of Navadka, 30 kilometers away from the Turkish border. And then the Turkish troops uh, reached this uh, camp and uh, started shooting at it. Uh, and that led to a situation where the 2,000 um, IS widows, women, uh, they were only women and uh, supporters of IS, uh, they could flee and uh, set fire to the camp. And hence, our uh, center was also affected. Uh, we lost one of our best centers in the region. And fortunately, we could uh, rescue our team and, uh, uh, and ask them to go back to Raqqa. And also in uh, the uh, province Hasaka in uh, Regia, we have four centers. Uh, and on the first day, we decided uh, to uh, um, when it comes to our activities with the administration, with the youth and uh, civilians, uh, we started to focus on humanitarian help. And uh, we um, created teams of volunteers. And uh, we developed a humanitarian uh, plan for support for these thousands of people from the regions who were fleeing towards Hasaka. And uh, for this, uh, 61 schools were um, uh, reused. And uh, uh, you know they're not designed to take on families, uh, men, women, children of different ages uh, for weeks. But um, we <clears throat> uh, demanded that the schools were uh, changed uh, um, so that they could uh, offer um, you know, hot water, running water in the schools so that people could feel better. But that's all we could do, really. We wanted to uh, um, make life easier for them. But also, the administration wasn't really able to do any more. The number of refugees is increasing every hour. And today, another 51 villages were attacked and taken over by Turkey, uh, by Turkey and their supporting militias. and. Um, <clears throat> And the um, inhabitants uh, fled towards Hamisha and Raqqa. And I know many people from Baslain and Tel Masir. And these are the um, focuses of the uh, conflict. And, uh, and if I talk to the people there, uh, there are at least 35 percent of the people who uh, decide to flee because of fear for their lives. And it's very macabre that the people of Afin learn from uh, their experiences. So <clears throat> at the moment, they're not just taking their documents and their valuables, but also their cattle. 
because they could see that in Afin, even chicken and cows uh, were stolen and uh, slaughtered. And uh, that also shows the extent of the hate with which these groups uh, invade these regions. And it also shows you the concept that they introduce in this region. And it shows you also how difficult it will be for the people to return to their villages once these groups and the Turkish military um, you know, maintain the control of this region. Many thanks. Well, it's a phenomenon that uh, we could see from the beginning, a very strong uh, movement of uh, refugees. And uh, therefore, I think it's a very big aspect to point it out. It's not the first Turkish military attack on Syrian soil. Um, we, you know, we forgot already that Afin is already under their control and and what has happened and, uh, and, and that people, you know, would possibly not be able to return in a in an Ahman. How did the people in uh, the Kurdish regions experience the war in the eight years previous? Uh, so from 2011, so, so the situation from 2011 until the invasion. Well, the region was um, under the leadership of the PYG and the Kurdish actors uh, in this region. And they controlled it and, uh, and they managed also to take over the, the leadership uh, of this uh, region. And that means it was um, seen as a um, Kurdish project in Syria. And you can say that until the Turkish invasion, this region was stable. And there was less crime, for example, especially uh, you know when it comes to affected civilians. And I don't know what exactly you are, mm, what you want to know. For example, my own family, I can report about them they could stay, unlike other family members uh, who had to flee and uh, to other Syrian cities. And for them, this experience for, of uh, Syrian autonomy was uh, the guarantee for them so that they could uh, stay. And uh, it was the only region and uh, that was spared. It was the only region they could flee to. and. Uh, uh, and the people have experienced uh, um, uh, this, and they learned their lesson. They could see what happened in other cities and also in a city like Aflin, not just the crimes that were committed, but also, uh, you know, that they did not uh, have any more crimes as a reaction on um, the Turkish invasion. For example, my family uh, immediately started packing and leaving once the Turks announced uh, uh, their invasion. They knew that they couldn't come back. And, um, and so this uh, feeling of loss and, uh, pers uh, you know, loss of perspective is what people experienced vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Turkish uh, state. This is what they experienced uh, personally, because you mentioned it, the situation before 2011. Maybe you could say something about that. Um, this experience of uh, autonomy is something new for the Turkish people, uh, Kurdish people, sorry, for in the Kurdish regions. I think I know what you are hinting at, a situation in the Kurdish regions. Uh, uh, maybe in, uh, maybe uh, Ferhat can say more because he was very um, active in the Turkish opposition. But it's very um, representative for the Kurdish uh, representation. 
um, because after the uh, the PYD took leadership, uh, the political landscape in the region was very uh, diverse. Uh, and also regarding the uh, Kurdish opposition. And uh, yes, so the political landscape was much more diverse and uh, they were also a bit restricted uh, in their political activities, they were suppressed, uh, but uh, they experienced their local stories. And uh, in my opinion, this has not well, has been ignored somewhat. Uh, the Kurdish dimension, for example, in the region of Cezire, uh, they were not really present because the PYD, um, they presented themselves as a caretaker of the Kurdish opposition. And uh, so you are presented with these facts. And uh, so that was uh, the politics of uh, the leadership. But if you talk about the Kurdish movement, then it's very important uh, to differentiate that there are Kurdish movements in the individual countries that uh, are part of Kurdistan. And uh, so um, we should not um, leave and uh, deny um, the Kurdish uh, movement in Syria um, their attention because this local structure, for example, in Jezide, um, they very much uh, questioned their own leadership even though their own experience is very unique. And uh, uh, the local and uh, historic uh, dimensions have to be considered and taken into account as well, especially when we talk about visions and solutions. Thank you. Fahad, maybe you want to say something about this? Well, uh, in the entire Kurdish region, from Afrin to the Tiflis, in this region before um, <clears throat> the occupation of Aflin in the last couple of years, for the first time in the history of the Kurdish people, you had a Kurdish administration. The people of the region could administer their own region. This is the first time it happened. I was born in Kamishli and I grew up there until my uh, A-levels. and. Uh, I can't remember that we ever had a mayor from our city. Our mayor was always uh, determined uh, by the state. From He came from Homs, from Raqqa or elsewhere, and they should be our mayor. The same goes for the governor and the head of police. Many of those uh, were coming from Homs, from Raqqa. Uh, so, uh, that they could uh, suppress us faster. And uh, so that was the first time in the history of Syria that it was different, that the governor, the mayor, came from the same city. And uh, that is a true democratic experience. Well, you can't really say that. It's, uh, you know, a scene of uh, conflict, of wars, and uh, there are many radical organizations uh, active. Also, the regime is still present in certain parts of town. They still have their secret service and military present. But when it came to violations of human rights in Syria, 
the violations in these regions that were carried out by their administration were always the lowest of all the actors, whether it was the regime or IS or other opposition groups, also Turkish troops. That's what you have to say as well. We as civil organizations, we have our problems or we have had our problems with the administration on site. You know, sometimes we couldn't do this or that. But we existed and we could develop further. And our center has existed for five years um, and uh, before even with the team since 2011. That's not the case in other regions. It's much more difficult for civil organizations to exist and to carry out their work for such a long time. That's what you have to mention as well. And uh, what you intend when this uh, region is uh, um, get started is not uh, to have a democratic administration or an administration that's being more inclusive, but in principle that this is being um, return to a situation where the mayor does no longer come from the same city but from uh, other cities. That's what just happened in Aflin. Now the administration in Aflin is under in Turkish hands, no longer in Syrian. So also uh, the people who fought you know, to bring part of the Turkish land under their control, they are no longer um, a, a sideshow, but the Turkish occupiers are in charge. And this terrible um, naming of this uh, offensive, this uh, source of peace, you know, everything is being uh, um, restricted and, um, and we have to stop it. Christine Hellbeck. Well, before the offensive in Germany, there was a perception that the Syria war was coming to an end. Perhaps you could put this into perspective. What does this uh, new conflict mean? Well, actually, this perception means that we think that battles go down and Assad had uh, more regions under control, and only two regions were not controlled, uh, Idlib and the northeast, so one quarter of the uh, area. And for Assad, it was a smart solution to get the northeast again under control because the deal between the uh, Putin and Erdogan uh, outlined the separation of the Northeast. So Turkey may keep what they conquered, uh, area of uh, 20 times 30 kilometers, and uh, is even allowed to resettle refugees with the green light from Moscow. And for the people mentioned by Fahad, it means that they can not be returned. So we have many uh, internally displaced people, and the regime will take over the Northeast. And we see already now how the regime troops try to take take over, and the regime had never completely begun in Kamishli. There are still neighborhoods that are controlled by the regime, so it had never completely disappeared, but it uh, was subordinated to the Kurdish administration, and in the uh, midterm, it will be the end of Kurdish autonomy. So the last battleground is the Idlib province, and it's only a question of time that this area will be reconquered. Ninety percent, uh, it is controlled by uh, 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 jihadist troops. So many uh, 
Syrians look to Idlib and say it's the jihadis who now fight the Turks, and quite understandably so because those who started there to uh, defend uh, demonstrations are now look like brainwashed um, mercenaries of Erdogan, and these troops now are now m massacring the uh, people in the northeast, which leads to the growing hatred between Arabs and uh, Kurds in the country and in Idlib, the three million civilians will flee to Turkey where Baghdadi was just killed and you really wonder how he could hide there uh, near to the Turkish border. So this area is now the area under air attacks by Russia and by the regime in order to be reconquered. And now the question arises, once this is done, will the war be over? What does it mean for the refugees? And then the big challenge is that Syria is not safe, though they're fighting has stopped, but this doesn't mean that the uh, Syrian refugees can return because when they come from areas that were controlled by the opposition, that they are generally uh, under suspicion. So these people will not be safe when they return. So we have to be clear when we discuss when can Syrians return, that it takes longer and we have to see how safe Syria will be under the Assad regime. And just one remark about the Kurds and 2011. The uh, Kurds were oppressed also in Syria. Fahad uh, has just described that the mayors always came from other regions. The Kurds were not allowed to speak Kurdish. And during the uh, 21st of March, there were always some uh, provocators uh, in order to shed a poor light on the Kurdish. And the regime had already started to create a so-called Arab belt uh, in order to support Arab nationalism. So it was a way to keep the people calm. Uh, Assad said, we are all Arabs, no matter what your belief is. And this was, of course, at the cost of the 5% or 10% of uh, Kurds who were no Arabs. There was a census and uh, 150,000 Kurds uh, they, for, from them, uh, the uh, nationality was withdrawn, so they uh, didn't have certain rights like to study or to travel, or some even were not allowed to use hotels. This was the history in order to understand that what uh, PYD built up during the last few years was much better than what they had before. Thank you for highlighting this. Let me add, in the Syrian, Syrian discourse, you say, well, at the end, the uh, Kurds, they uh, went together with the regime. The fact that the Kurds now uh, go with uh, the regime just proves that the Kurds have 
nobody, not only with regard to the laws or the Syrian policy towards the Kurds, uh, with regard to Turkey and Syria, they have not only seen what happened in Afrin, but they also experienced what happened in 2004. And I was there in Jazeera that uh, where there was a stupid football game where some football uh, supporters uh, called Saddam Hussein uh, chance to provoke the Kurds. And this led to unrest. And the Syrian regime then shot at uh, Kurdish protesters. And afterwards, in 2004, and I was in a girls' school, so uh, we Kurdish girls were searched every morning because uh, they told us we would bring weapons into uh, the school. And this happened until 2004. And this is the hatred Assad is using. These are the uh, historical dynamism, I mentioned the Assad regime does not only uh, say that uh, the uh, regime is currently the only alternative the Kurds harm have, but uh, he also uses the hatred and the position of Arab tribes and the Kurds who are now seen as traitors in the eyes of the others uh, if when they flee uh, they would uh, they will never welcome uh, that the regime takes over power N not only the syrian regimes continues with nationalism we also see that the Syrian opposition was unable to develop something pluralistic. And when I say opposition, it's the national coalition in Turkey. And it's actually uh, ideologically stuck in nationalism. These are the only ideas they have developed. And we see it uh, in the case of the Kurdish. And this also uh, led to more uh, hatred on both sides because in the opinion of many Arab uh, revolutionaries, the Kurds did not participate in the revolution. But from a Kurdish perspective, these oppositions that who take a high-handed approach are unable to develop a vision for Syria where also uh, the Kurds have a place. The Kurds are left alone by the U.S. Uh, and now uh, in an alliance with the regime. What about Russia? Russia has just agreed the uh, armistices. Can the Kurds hope for Russian support? I think the dilemma you see in the world with regard to the northeast of Syria is the following. Only interest of state structures are taken into consideration. When we speak about the situation overall, you say Turkey is a state with the second strongest NATO army, and their interests outweigh the interests of the Kurds. And when the media stop reporting, uh, the world will forget it. 
though uh, Turkey says, I go there to do ethnic cleansing. Erdogan just said today, this war is a continuation of our independence war. These are our lands. We go there to just to get our due. And the whole world hears this. And our foreign minister goes to Istanbul and hides himself behind the Turkish foreign minister instead of sending out messages. He returns without a political plan, without any demands. And the same applies to the United States and I think uh, also to Russia. Though Russia uh, plays as a kind of protection power and without the uh, support from Russia and Iran, the regime would no longer be in power. But uh, Russia also has no plan as to the Kurds and has never presented any plan to the Kurds. There were different meetings not only with the self-administration, but also the opposition, uh, the National Council, they also went to Russia and asked, what now? What role will you play in Syria? And what impact can you have on the regime uh, for the constitution to be adopted, for the Kurds to get rights? And uh, Russia always said, we have no influence on the regime. You should uh, make efforts like all the other groups. What does it mean just to rely on the Americans? And it's interesting that Putin said, well, your future with the regime, you can negotiate in Damascus. We will no longer be intermediators. So everything you want, you should negotiate with the regime. This means Russia will not play an active role to promote federalism, and it has no interest. Russia wants to have a strong central state that can be controlled by a power center in Damascus. And therefore, Russia has no interest in decentralization or and more power in the provinces. The uh, Putin knows that the PID is uh, weak now, and there may perhaps be some rights to use the Kurdish language. The rest will be under central control. And Putin is quite happy with this because then it's much easier for him to remote control the country. You just mentioned the German Minister of Defense who made a proposal uh, about a safe zone, a safe zone, saying that uh, coordinated by Germany, Russia, and Turkey, would it have changed anything? What can such a concept look like to work together with the powers who bombard Syria and who demonstrated they have the weapons. Diplomacy has not took, taken us anywhere. The proposal also came too late. What I disliked about the debate that many German parties criticized it, even from the CDU, the uh, minister was not supported, but most criticized the uh, procedure but did not uh, table a proposal themselves. They are probably the uh, proposal had not been agreed. But what is the counter proposal? I think if 
massacres are to be prevented and a solution is to be found. The international community has to do something. The EU can also try to do something or the three most important states can take their initiative, but the issue needs to remain on the table. One has to discuss how people, refugees can return and how they can continue to lead their life there. And there must be a debate to do everything to prevent ethnic cleansing and that Turkey must not install other displaced people in order not to pre-program another Syrian war and the burdens will come back to Europe when people again flee this region in 10 years time. It's now the time to do politics, not just to uh, criticize attacks, but a policy looking for solutions. I admit it's difficult. The Americans try to do it, and they also took into consideration the so-called security interests of Turkey. There were security mechanisms the Turks were allowed to do patrols, and uh, there was also a promise to withdraw heavy arms. There were joined German-U.S. patrols, and suddenly Erdogan said, no, I don't like it. There have been uh, proposals for solutions, but Turkey didn't want to heed them. Yes, I've saw you too, and I would like to ask you also, and uh, would like to ask uh, Christian Hellberg and Ferhat Alman and uh, Maybe we can go a little bit beyond it. What can be done politically and uh, by diplomatic means? And what can the individuals do to uh, support civilians uh, in Syria? Um, in general, uh, not just in these regions, but as you said, Mr. Hellberg, in Idlib, uh, many people are fleeing. Uh, and uh, two to three million people, and uh, even if uh, the UN talk, uh, say that 90 percent of uh, the people uh, in the region are civilians, it is something that's easily been forgotten how many people are affected by it. They are not perpetrators. And uh, so, therefore, Christian Helberg and uh, in honor. Um, uh, what can be done politically or diplomatically, and what can individuals do to uh, support uh, civilians in Syria? Okay. Well, the idea of uh, protective zones is not new. It's a demand of the Syrians since 2012. Since Assad has been using its own air force against residential areas uh, that were controlled by opposition forces, and the demands were repeated and they were always rejected, that uh, it was said that you need a UN a mandate for it, and, uh, and the Russians prevented it with their veto vote. Therefore, we haven't had a protection of civilians, and at the same time, all foreign forces uh, intervened uh, in following their own interest and bombarding uh, uh, the country. And uh, that was always the excuse. Uh, we need a UN mandate to uh, intervene. And that's uh, um, we see at the moment that in Idlib, uh, the same is repeating uh, what happened in 2015, the previous story. Um, of the refugee crisis is that Europe uh, um, failed. It, we didn't protect the people. We didn't give them uh, um, a proper way to exist. And uh, and then the people 
obviously fled and uh, in an uncontrolled way via the Balkan route and spent all their savings, risked their lives because Europe wasn't able to take the people and uh, take responsibility now. We sent our Minister of Interior to Ankara or Istanbul, and we are saying to him that, uh, yes, thank you very much for keeping the Syrians at bay, and do you need money for your protection of the borders? And uh, um, there are obviously areas where uh, you know, the protection doesn't work, where the jihadists get through. They all came to Syria via Turkey. And so how do we want to prevent that the three millions in Idlib or the several hundred thousand in the Kurdish areas who cannot stay there uh, will end up in Europe at some point? So what is the conclusion? Uh, what have we learned from 2015? Uh, uh, those people are sitting already um, in camps along the border. And what the foreign minister meant when he said we have no time for theoretical debates because we have to help the people in a humanitarian way, it shows how short term um, short term the politics in Germany is. And for Mrs. Kam Karrenbauer um, now mentioned uh, uh, something that uh, Mr. Maas could have. Uh, formulated uh, one year ago a strategy for the Northeast. That's when Mr. Trump said already uh, we want to get back and Erdogan said we want to intervene. And uh, so Mr. Maas is now trying to wriggle out and uh, say everything is too late. But it's only too late because he didn't really mention it. He didn't discuss it. And Mrs. Kam Karnbauer said we need a safety zone. And uh, so that the um, Syrian uh, refugees can return and then can um, rebuild the country. And so then everybody said, OK, how can they re returning r refugees is something that Erdogan wants to do, too. And uh, so in a way, we are supporting Assad. and. Uh, and that was the big problem of Mrs. Kam Karrenbauer. She doesn't really know what she's talking about. And she's irritating a lot of people in the other parties. The Greens also said very clearly, we don't want to finance an open air prison. You know, that's something that she probably didn't want as well. And. Uh, and the idea of an international protected zone uh, um, that ultimately, you know, is under risk of being bombarded as well. So that only leaves a very, very few people who uh, do get uh, engaged in Syria. And it leaves the question, what can we do? Well via diplomatic uh, channels. The Constitutional Committee that's meeting tomorrow in Geneva shouldn't be overestimated. Uh, I think we'll have to understand that there can only be a military solution. And we also have to make sure that we accept that Assad will stay in power for the time being. And um, most people can only work in the diaspora. This what uh, I would see the focus uh, of this campaign and maybe there are uh, possibilities together with other media, with other people in Syria. But it's very difficult, you know, they risk their lives. So it has to be on a low level. Well, I would like uh, on one hand to comment uh, the Constitutional Committee and then also the proposal of a protection zone. If I hear protection zone, then I expect that at least uh, civilians can be protected. The question is now um, from whom and uh, and if the conditions Turkey and Russia and uh, Assad in brackets have to be involved, that must be a joke. If you really think that these two forces that committed the most crimes, um, killed most civilians and endangered most civilians, that these two forces should be involved in such a protection zone, 
Mm, and what also what I don't like about the debate is that uh, Turkey creates facts, takes the first step, and then we in Germany think on how to react. Do we want to get involved or not? And this question is not just arrogant, but this question mm, is also making a fool of the German public, but also about, uh, you know, of yourself. You know, Germany is involved already, in trading weapons, paying for refugees, etc. And, uh, you know, we are also a NATO partner of Turkey. And uh, so we shouldn't really speculate on what kind of intentions Erdogan has. I mean, uh, we should have uh, uh, seen at the latest after Aflin on uh, what kind of crimes Turkey is capable of uh, committing. And so we have to say to our people how we are involved, how we want to be involved so that uh, the rulers in the region, um, you know, whom we have enabled to kill their own people, to use chemical weapons against their own people. So that is a problem uh, in the debate in the Syrian war. Um, uh, that most people don't really know how much we are involved in these conflicts. And we can only see the results, the refugees, and then the people get annoyed, and then parties are created who are against the refugees. And this is also a problem of information. How many, how much are people entitled to know and uh, of course, every time when it's about Turkey, then the measures are economic sanctions and then restricting travel and tourism to Turkey. But um, uh, the political leadership in Germany doesn't really want to get involved. And that's really um, uh, annoying for the people in Kurdistan and, uh, you know, Assad regime, the Assad regime cannot be the best solution. And he just said, uh, you know, that he doesn't work together with the actors who uh, cooperated with the United States. So the Kurds cannot uh, get involved because all of these injustices from the past are still there. and. Uh, uh, and, of course, uh, they have committed a big mistake uh, in the eyes of the regime. And, uh, and we've heard many constructive proposals and visions, and there are so many possibilities to put pressure on Turkey, but there is no will to do it. And that's the problem, in my opinion. It's not that there is no vision. There is no vision for those who uh, want to get involved. Um, we don't really react uh, to what uh, Turkey is doing. OK, we have to get uh, involved and react because uh, we are involved. And that's a different statement. OK, many thanks. There are there have been many proposals, and I think anticipating is one of the topics that you mentioned, all of you, and, uh, you know, that we always react to what just happened as if it hasn't been um, planned for a long time. And um, now I want to uh, come to a discussion with uh, the people in the audience, and you have uh, uh, asked for the floor, and the gentleman in blue, and then also the gentleman in the second row. Please introduce yourself briefly and um, be brief uh, with your question. And uh, if you have a concrete question, then direct it to one of the panelists. Well, first of all, I would like to ask you to uh, keep uh, my time because I 
get lost. Uh, Secondly, I would like to excuse myself. I'm not very educated. I'm a part of the working class, the non-educated. I have a first. Uh, um, I have a uh, uh, very low education, so that's what I want to say beforehand. And I have witnessed several wars because I'm very much interested in why. Uh, people are uh, hitting each other since 4,000 years. And what the Kurds are doing at the moment, or what's happening with the Kurds, reminds me of uh, Chechnya, Kosovo, the Machiavellian principle of removing minorities. The technique is very simple. If you don't have atomic uh, power, then you know, if you, 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 you provoke them so that the minority becomes aggressive and then you can morally discredit them and then the door is open for an Assad regime or any other regime that uh, um, has a strong military and uh, atomic weapons. And I believe, as a small person, simple man, that Turkey is very much interested in massacring the Tur Kurds, not just because uh, they don't like them, but because they will then turn against them. And you know, if you provoke a massacre, in my opinion, you want to sow hatred, you want to remove them from the country, and secondly, to, to, to create something like the Uchika in Kosovo, uh, you know, that hits back. And I hope that it won't happen in uh, the Syria, and I hope that Turks, uh, Kurds, excuse me, um, will and uh, not um, hit back and uh, because that's uh, what Turkey wants and the Kurds just wants they just want to defend their territory well you already heard um, that these massacres haven't occurred yet and we hope that uh, you will be wrong with your um, assumption and uh, perhaps we can uh, give the microphone to the gentleman in blue Thank you. I'm Gerrit Kurz. I'm from the German Society for Foreign Policy. Mrs. Hellberg, you had uh, mentioned that it would have been better to deliberate uh, a year ago. Well, that's uh, what Mr. Maas should have done. And uh, uh, of course, now I would be very much interested. Um, it's addressed to you also, the other two panelists. How? Uh, could such a plan uh, have looked like for the for the Northeast that includes and takes into account that the United States will remove their truth? So you should have given certain security guarantees. And if Turkey doesn't trust the Kurds, then these uh, should be other troops, maybe you, United Nations troops, European troops, if they do trust them at all. So if uh, you could have done it like that, but assuming it would have been possible and there would have been an international mission on one side or both sides of the border in the Northeast, and you would still have the situation that the people in the West, that um, in Idlib, that uh, still had been uh, bombarded, that you you would have had international troops that could have protected one part of Syria at best, but another part would have been bombarded still. And um, I don't want to overcomplicate things, but I can see the problems that did exist, and uh, perhaps uh, you have some thoughts about it. Uh, we will try to show you something on the screen. There is also another gentleman in the second row that wanted to take the floor. So, I thought you had sich gemeldet. Jetzt will ich Ihnen einen Kommentar aufhelfen. Gut, dann die Dame dort in Rot, in Grau. My name is. 
I'm the great Masoch, and I'm a member of the city partnership and Kreuzberg. Uh, and uh, I would like to ask how people can be supported. I think, okay, it's a difficult situation, but we of a city partnership, we, for example, send money for the health uh, uh, supply, and I think this should have been done um, all the time before this um, civilian support. And uh, Hinderik, for example, is multi-ethnical. It's a multi-ethnical community. And uh, what you said, it sh there should have been a bigger knowledge, a bigger conscious in the media also what has been built up in this region, also when it comes to the role of women. And uh, I think at the moment it's mainly about financial support so that the health uh, supply can be guaranteed. And, uh, and then, of course, schooling um, is possible in future. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, the map. Now we have the map. What did did you want to show us? It's not quite up to date, though. The uh, blue area does not yet include the uh, Turkish zone. So one fourth of the territory was northern Syria, and in red, uh, they these were conquered. Uh, before uh, Aleppo, a protectorate uh, conquered in 2016, and Afrin uh, early uh, uh, to, uh, 2018, and Idlib is also shown clearly, and the uh, area in uh, beige uh, is under control of the regime again. Well, uh, there were two questions. One question to everybody. What could a plan for the Northeast or perhaps also the Northwest could have looked like what would have been possible one year ago and what can security guarantees look like? Well, as to the plan, some people really gave it some thoughts. It was clear. Uh, Trump wanted to withdraw the U.S. troops and Erdogan, his plans were also clear. And actually, the Europeans also bear responsibility. They are also part of the anti-IS coalition. Uh, cities should have been rebuilt like Raqqa. We uh, participated in the bombing, but there are still hundreds of thousands of refugees who can not return. And this leads to lack of perspective of young people, no political participation. All this leads to extremists gaining ground. And then with regard to the Syrian Democratic Forces, we also have responsibility. Well, you are a thorn in the side of Erdogan. How would you be prepared to withdraw? And there was an offer to withdraw 10 kilometers uh, towards the uh, center, and then Europe should have been prepared to make such a protection zone of 10, 20, or 30 kilometers, uh, also controlled by European troops as an observation mission uh, in the best case. Uh, well, I don't claim that it is easy, but uh, the uh, if NATO partners take over the uh, U.S. role, uh, the uh, Turks would have said, well, what counts for us is that the PKK 
uh, affiliated party should withdraw and Russia would also have an interest because they want the West to participate in a solution at the end of which the Assad regime is again in control. And in such a case, Europe as the favorite partner of the Kurds, this is what I would claim, could have an impact on the political leadership on PYD saying, we protect you against a Turkish invasion and you give more room to uh, civil groups or you do more in the field of good governance. In an ideal case, this could have been a kind of a role model for Syria. Probably it's wishful thinking in your opinion, but this would have been the vision or the plan one year ago. For me, an international or European mission in the region would have been the uh, best mission financially, but also politically. There are trained people deployed at the border as uh, police. Uh, they also fought the IS and won the war with U.S. support, the SDF was prepared to withdraw its arms and troops. And then we, it would probably have taken two or three hundred European troops and the French were already there with about 300 troops and there is also enough money there is oil that can be used exactly what the Americans do now. This is no new invention. The Europeans and especially Germany uh, was really led the along the garden route by Turkey. Uh, we fought for a very long time also with the foreign ministry uh, for humanitarian aid and the answer was no. Always some difficulties were mentioned. At the end of the day, it was the wish of Turkey. They didn't want to see Germany in the region. And we, we uh, know even for humanitarian, no humanitarian aid was granted. The only compromise by the foreign ministry was we sent funds under the proviso that they are spent in regions with a majority Arab population. France half-heartedly to took up an initiative from the Kurdish civilians uh, population uh, provided some funds, but it did not put its weight behind it. So Europe just missed this opportunity because it doesn't exist as a European construct, not able to act. And I think uh, Europe will feel the outcome rather soon. It was a hi hypothetical question. Uh, we can ask hypothetical questions until tomorrow morning, but I think things would have been different if the Kurds or 
uh, and also the population in Idlib were not used as hostages with regard to our attitude to PKK, to Turkey, to Öcalan. So the focus was who needs to be protected and uh, whom do we have to retain? I think the uh, thought was, do we want to protect the uh, Kurdish civilians? But we think PKK is an undemocratic organization. So uh, it's a kind of trying to convince yourself that there is no other option or uh, that you do not want to admit that you do not want to give up anything to protect civilians. And the question is, uh, do we really intend to protect civilians? And I also address the uh, activists. What is the concept of international solidarity that you want to implement in the region where, when you are a push, when you are pushed in a position, if the recognition of one issue requires to neglect another one? For eight years, it has been a major problem that the uh, rights of Kurdish women are welcomed in the US and in Europe, but the fights Syrian women fought in other parts of Syria are not recognized. And I think this is very arrogant because it's really Eurocentristic to pick out actors that present the image we want to see and we damage people we want to support m many did not really take a close look at the historical background of the Kurdish movement, but just used certain rhetorics because it's much nicer to say, well, we have this one image, and when we see that reality is uh, much more contradictory, then it makes things very complex. And the complex is, the situation is complex. And this is also due to the uh, uh, big powers like Russia. They cooperated with the regimes. Uh, they now want to save us from these post-colonial regimes who were their allies until the world found there are people in these countries who want to change their future, who want to change these regimes. I think it's great that we show solidarity to the Kurds, but real sol solidarity also requires not to act in a Eurocentristic way and to take into consideration the life of people on site to recognize their histories. Otherwise, it's just a new form of, a, of a kind of selective, dogmatic, uh, blackmailing solidarity. Well, this uh, was very interesting, and it sounded already like a kind of final word. But are there other people who want to add something? You just mentioned it. 
Could you tell us something about the historical context, how the Kurdish movement developed? Was there a time where Syria and the Kurds got along quite well? Any other questions or comments? Please use the mic for the interpreters. So my general impression leads me to the question, well, everything sounds quite hopeless, at least to uh, the what uh, Europe can do. And if these plans already existed one year ago before Kram Karrenbauer, what were the reasons why this question of international responsibility was not debated? Only the fear of Turkey that they open the gates uh, for more refugees coming to Germany, or was it more than just bare uh, fear? Are there other questions? And I think uh, we then also have some time to discuss in smaller groups, but I would ask the panelists what were the reasons for previous uh, pro proposals not being taken up, or then also say something about the development of the Kurdish movement in Syria? Uh, have the, has the relationship between the regime and the Kurds always been a problem? Uh, it's a major issue, and to be brief is probably very difficult. There are now refugee flows of internally displaced people. What about the solidarity of Kurdish groups in Iraq? We have to be brief, but I think it's a very important aspect. I will be brief why the plans will not be taken up. There is no European foreign policy. We have wanted to develop it for 20 years, but uh, Europe is uh, just dismantling itself and uh, Germany and France were all and, and also not, and not prepared to take the lead. Uh, the Brexit alone shows that we also have other issues to deal with in Europe. And the other one is the fear of Erdogan and the refugees. So uh, it's more domestic policy we uh, pursue in Syria. We just want uh, to block more refugees and while we do not have a sustainable refugee policy, we can be blackmailed by people like Erdogan. So uh, if we do not mention, um, manage to pass immigration laws, we will remain unable to act in conflicts like the one in Syria. Perhaps I can add a sentence. Uh, I believe uh, the Euro European politics uh, has, uh, or rather the statement of Trump that he would remove his troops, they didn't really take it serious in Europe. Uh, you know, they believed that, okay, it was only words and uh, he would make sure in the end. Uh, but the German commentators, one month after his uh, statement uh, in December last year, they already said that he already took back his uh, 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 removal statement and he wouldn't really materialize. His threats wouldn't really materialize. And, uh, but maybe they couldn't see through his uh, Trump's politics and uh, that uh, 
uh, it doesn't listen to his administration and his Congress and uh, create such a chaos. And in Europe, they relied uh, on the fact that it would uh, happen somehow and uh, would be better regarding the Kurds. It's very complex. But the entire region, including today's Turkey, Iraq, it was part of the Osmanian Empire or the Osman Empire. And, uh, and then uh, when um, it ceased and these republics uh, were created, of course, the process was much longer. But uh, to the detriment of the Kurds, and the Kurds were then uh, separated. Part of them were in Iran and uh, the other three parts, Syria, uh, Iraq, and Turkey. And that's how the Kurdish question came about, the Kurdish, Syrian, Iranian, Turkish uh, question. And um, every state has uh, developed a different policy vis-a-vis -vis the Kurds, and they all agree that all political Kurdish movements should be suppressed so that they could never really manage to uh, gain their own state or status in Iraq. They were quite successful since the 1930s. Uh, they have managed to uh, have Kurdish uh, as an official language accepted, and they have also um, concluded an uh, an autonomous agreement and um, autonomy agreement. And um, so that was probably the biggest success of the modern Kurdish history. And, uh, and of course, Uja uh, was the second big success story. But in Syria, since its existence, uh, Syria has. Uh, has followed a pan-Arabian policy via, uh, via the Kurds, and uh, and uh, there were also plans on how to uh, uh, get uh, make sure that the Kurds could no longer visit universities and uh, be part of the civilian society, but also how to remove them from uh, the Euphrates region to the Kurdish region so that the Kurdish majority would no longer exist. And um, so that all Kurdish ambitions were brutally suppressed. And I think there are only very few Kurds there, there who, during their lifetime, uh, have never had to deal with the Syrian secret service, whether they were arrested for an hour and uh, interviewed, and uh, but there was no, uh, no, there were no nice periods for the Kurds in this state. Uh, the question with the historic uh, background was explained by Fahad, I think, but um, perhaps, well, uh, this uh, well, sad and uh, statement, as you said, it's not that um, sad, really. It's we can our uh, we can influence um, uh, our politics vis-a-vis -vis Turkey, and we can also work on our structures and the Syrian uh, to, to empower uh, the Syrian people to get their, uh, Syrian Kurds to get their representation. You mentioned the Constitutional Committee. There are only three Kurds in this group as representatives, and even that is questionable because uh, Fahad has also mentioned that uh, the Kurdish National Council is represented as well. That uh, doesn't even uh, create, uh, doesn't have a base uh, in the people um, in the country. So how can they be represented? Um, you know, and other people we just need it uh, for the um, military action. But um, with the power we have, we can already we can make sure that the local people are represented accordingly in these international negotiations that are ongoing at the moment. Uh, 
And it's also quite sad to know, as you said, uh, that we don't expect much from this constitutional committee and um, and also when it comes to our refugee policy and uh, the threats, uh, the Turkish threats vis-a-vis uh, -vis the refugees. It's um, terrible that uh, Turkey expresses threats um, and uses uh, the refugees as a weapon. And uh, we should actually make sure that, you know, we fight for our rights, what we stand for, for our, our constitution. And uh, I think there are a lot of things we can do uh, here in Germany. Uh, maybe I can say something as well. Um, just uh, Turkey prevents that the PYD will be there in Geneva tomorrow as well. 150 Syrians will be discussing uh, the Constitution. Well, that's not quite true because uh, foreign powers are represented uh, uh, as well, and one more critical word, Syria doesn't new, need a new constitution. They just had a new constitution in 2012 that even gave even more power to the president. But even if they would write a new constitution, that wouldn't change the power in the country. The regime would still rule as before. and. Uh, uh, you know, you want uh, freedom of press, of opinion, that people can get active uh, politically. And, of course, it takes time after 50 years of dictatorship, but the regime is not interested in uh, uh, letting go their power. And uh, so we shouldn't have any illusions here when it comes to this constitutional committee. But now, as a conclusion, I mentioned the aspect the Syrians abroad. I think in order to make progress long term in Syria, it helps to talk about it with the Syrians on how they want to live together because the hatred and the mistrust is so big that the people would just shout at each other for two, you know, after two minutes. These uh, um, uh, rifts in the societies uh, are. Um, enormous and there were so many crimes committed so that now we need an environment where we can talk to each other, can listen to each other without taking it personal and acknowledge what the other person, what kind of emotions the other person has. I think that's a very big step for the Syrian revolution. Um, of 2011. And I think that a lot of Syrians who live here, uh, they have realized that the revolution has to take place at home. Whether you are Arab or Kurd, it doesn't matter. We want to create a country for all citizens, and that's what uh, should and could be supported in Germany. We have to make sure that all the Germans understand it too properly. You know, we can help uh, by looking at the German constitution and become active in the diaspora together with you and create a platform for this exchange. I think that's quite important, quite essential for the people who want to build up something in Syria that comes close to what uh, the people in 2011 wanted. Many thanks. That's it. That was constructive, excuse me. And, uh, and I, it's, I think it's important to tell the Syrian partners, if we don't lose hope, then you can't lose it either. This is uh, one point I take on board, solidarity, real solidarity in order to uh, um, make sure we can overcome the rifts and uh, what's most important also foreign policy with a good vision in order to make sure that we cannot be held um, uh, we cannot be blackmailed and also can set some Science, give some science for the future. Many thanks to you on the panel. Many thanks to you in the audience, to my team um, who made sure that everything is working, to the people in the booths and also the technicians. Many thanks.